Welcome everybody. On this video, we're going to be talking about a company called DoorDash. DoorDash is a food delivery company similar to Grubhub or Uber Eats or any other logistics food delivery company. Now, I have a position in DoorDash. It's one of my investments and I'm continually building up that position. So I am bullish on this company despite its high market cap. This company has a $62 billion market cap, which a lot of people say that's insane for just this app and this food delivery company. That's a bigger market cap than like FedEx, right? Or these traditional logistics companies. But I think it deserves it. And I'm not the only one. There's a lot of institutions currently buying into this company. For instance, there's a hedge fund called Aurora Capital. I have their investor letter here and their thesis on investing into DoorDash. So they make the case, this hedge fund, that DoorDash is going to double in value from $60 billion to $120 billion in 2025. So like five years from now, which would give you a return if you invest now of 15% per year. An annualized return of 15% is really good. So we're going to take a look at this hedge fund letter, why they're so bullish on DoorDash, especially when there's other alternatives. And we're also going to take a look at the company overall. I want to explain why I think it's beating Uber Eats at their own game. Now, first of all, let's take a look at the Story Fund. This is my personal portfolio. It's called the Story Fund. It's really a highly aggressive, growth-centered portfolio where I search for companies that I think will be the big players in big industries. So I'm looking for companies that I think will be the big winners of the winner-take-most markets. So, for instance, with, with media and movies and TV shows and documentaries and you know uh, uh, comedy specials, I think that Netflix is going to be one of the biggest winners overall in that market. And that's part of the reason that I'm invested in that company. The same thing with online retail and companies like Amazon and Shopify. I try to pick the companies that I think will be the big winners. So that is the, the purpose of this portfolio. I'm tracking it against the S&P 500 to see my performance over a year over year basis. If you want to follow along, make sure you subscribe to the channel with the bell on and then you get notifications. And if you want to see all my holdings in this portfolio, there's a link in the description that you can click around. And then I even put in another one that shows my watch list of companies I'm currently looking at and keeping track of. So you can check that out if you're interested. Now, let's go ahead and talk about my DoorDash position here. I currently have $1,600 value holding here, about $210 as gains. And that's about 2.4% of my portfolio overall. I want to grow this position to be about 5%. So I'm still in the process of building up my DoorDash position. Let's go ahead and talk about what DoorDash actually is. If we look at this breakdown here, DoorDash has three major components. You have the consumers. Those are like you and me, the people ordering from it. You have the merchants. Those are the restaurants making the food. And then you have the dashers. Those are independent contractors that work for DoorDash similar to employees, but not exactly the same. And they're the ones that bring the food from the restaurants to the consumers. So these are the three major players in this company. I wanna go through each of them. So let's go ahead and first take a look at the consumer portion. The consumer's main interaction comes through the DoorDash food delivery app, which is very popular. This is one of the most downloaded apps over the past couple of years because the lockdowns kind of spurred the whole food delivery business and they've received a ton of downloads. Now, DoorDash has grown dramatically. To give you an idea of how many times their app has been downloaded, it currently has 10.6 million reviews on the Apple App Store. That's the amount of people that have reviewed the app, not the amount of people that have actually downloaded it. And only a small portion of people actually end up reviewing apps. And then it has a 4.8 star rating, 4.8 out of 5, which is incredibly good. That means the huge, vast majority of people are giving it a, a five-star rating, which is, is incredibly good. 10.6 million ratings, 4.8 stars. And I agree with this. I think that DoorDash does deserve a 4.8 stars. I think the app is really good. But this is the first interaction that the consumer has. And really, it's the majority that they have with DoorDash is the app. They go into the app portal. They do the onboarding experience where they they have it say, hey, we want to share your location so we can see where your home is and have the dashers deliver the food to your house. So you share your location or you can just manually type in your address and then it populates restaurants around you and quickly you're able to glance through a whole selection of food of different, uh, you know, you can do healthy food, grocery food, you can do American cuisine and so on and so forth. Once you pick what restaurant you want to order from, the restaurant puts in the customization of it so you can go through. And the menus and everything, I think, are very easy to navigate. They really made the checkout process 
as seamless as possible. And it, of course, does things like remembers your most recent order. So if you frequently order from the same place, it'll remember what you ordered last time so you don't have to go through the same checkout. Then you get the option of doing hand it to me or leave it at my door, which is great because if you don't want to have the social interaction of talking with the door dasher, right? If you don't want to have to actually take the food from them, you can just say, leave it at my door. And then they actually go, they drop it off at your door. Sometimes you can tell them, don't even ring the doorbell. You know, I get an app notification when you leave it. So they'll drop it off. And then usually they, they snap a photo of it on your doorstep just to make sure that they, you know, that you know that they actually delivered it. And then they text that to you. So right there, you know, the food's delivered. You can open up the door, grab your food and it's done. That's the transaction. So it, it works very easy from my experience, from a consumer perspective. Another thing that DoorDash does is they allow you to track the status of the delivery with live updates from a map. So you can see where your dasher is. You can see where the restaurant is that you ordered from and how all the logistics are going. You can actually get live updates as it's going. And they give you approximate times until it'll be delivered. So that is the majority of the experience from the consumer perspective. The people ordering the food, most of what you're dealing with is the DoorDash app. You sometimes deal with the dasher if you run into them or you have to text them or something, but that's usually in rare situations. If things go good, you really never have to do much with the dasher. They just drop off your food, they tell you it's there, and then it's done. Um, then we have the merchant's experience. The merchant can be like, you know, 7-Eleven, it can sometimes be a grocery chain, but most of the time it's restaurants and they have a completely different experience. When you order from DoorDash, it's not like the dasher calls the restaurant and calls in the order for you. That's not what happens. What happens is the merchant has their own software for their business and they receive the order directly. So your order goes directly to the merchant and then also pings a bunch of dashers that are around the DoorDash delivery people called dashers and they can choose to accept that order and they can choose to deliver it for you. So the merchant has their own unique software. If we look at that, the merchant software gives them a lot of analytics that they can't get normally on their business because if you normally have you know, customers coming and going, you don't get the same level of analytics that you do with something that has as much logistics as DoorDash. So of course you get a log of all your orders, what you're, you're making on each of them. So you can track your sales. You can also adjust your menu very easy. So if you have issues with the menu, you can upload pictures, adjust the descriptions, adjust the prices anytime, and then that instantly goes out to the DoorDash app. And then you can also uh, benchmark key metrics. So they have things like customer feedback and it's internally received, which is really important because if I'm a customer and I have a bad experience with a restaurant, a lot of times I never leave uh, like reviews. And the reason why is because if I leave a negative review on Google, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm hurting that restaurant's business. And sometimes I don't want to do that because it might be a unique experience and I don't want to go and blast them publicly on Google and have the Google review rating go down. Uh, and I think that that puts the restaurant in a pretty bad situation as well, because they might've had like a bad, you know, bad service or a bad meal. And it's a, a rare thing, but you can't really give them feedback without a, it being super awkward because you're giving the feedback directly to somebody at the restaurant in person, or B, you're doing it very publicly, leaving it on Google as a public Google review. So what DoorDash does is they solve this problem by allowing you to, to leave feedback to the restaurant privately. You can fill out a box and say, hey, you know, you gave me the, the wrong item here, or this tasted weird, or this wasn't cooked right. And then that just goes to the restaurant so they can adjust their restaurant without being publicly blasted. And you always have the option of publicly leaving a review on Google as well. But if you want to just give the restaurant feedback, you can do so. So that's another cool thing about DoorDash. It allows people to leave feedback and then that's all tracked internally. And that's basically it for the restaurant. They receive the orders, they have analytics on it, they can adjust the menu and they have internal feedback mechanisms. So I think it's a decent system for restaurants. Now, going back to this breakdown of the economics of DoorDash, we have the consumer on top. We already went over them. That's you and I ordering our food. But then we have the merchant, which is the restaurant that makes the food. And then we have the third piece here, which is called the Dasher. Dashers are the independent contractors that sign up with the Dasher app for DoorDash and they pick up the food from the merchant. They give it to you on your doorstep. That's the breakdown of the economics and the whole system of DoorDash here. So all DoorDash does is they connect these three different parties, the consumer, the merchant, and the Dasher. And it gives you a like an example breakdown of the economics. So if the consumer pays $32 for an order, 
DoorDash, they instantly get that $32. So DoorDash keeps the money, but then they pay the merchant $20 for the food. That's an example. And then DoorDash pays the Dasher $7.90. So that's how much the Dasher gets. And then DoorDash might keep $4.90. And that's the breakdown. Now, out of this, DoorDash does something interesting where they actually force the customer as they're ordering their food to pick out what they want to tip the Dasher. They don't wait until after the order because then the Dasher might get uh, stiffed, you know, and that doesn't really incentivize DoorDashers. So they don't want to go to an order and go all the way through the, the, the work of delivering your food and then have somebody be cheap and not, not pay them anything. So DoorDash says you have to tip them beforehand. And then if you have problems, if they did a, a poor job, just let us know and we'll refund you. That's how they deal with it. So you tip beforehand. You want to give the Dasher a good tip so that they do a good job, get your food on time. And then if you have any issues, you can say, hey, DoorDash, they did a terrible job. You can rate them poorly. And most of the time, DoorDash will actually give you like a refund. They will refund your meal. So it works out good for the consumer. It works out better for the DoorDasher because they're always insured that they're going to get paid what they're told beforehand. And it's not a mystery of how much money they're going to make, which I think is really good for Dashers. Now, DoorDash currently has 200,000 Dashers working for them. So they have people that are willing to deliver this food during any hours of the day or night. Sometimes these orders are in the middle of the night and there's always a dasher there to take an order. So my question was, how do they get all these people to work for them in this type of environment where it's an independent contractor and they don't pay the best, it's not the best paying job, and it's, it's sometimes hard on your vehicle because you're having to drive around a lot. So how do they get all these people to work for them? It explains it a little bit in this video. I live in South Jamaica, Queens, born and raised. I'm a door dasher. I'm a mama with special needs child. She is the love of my life. Door dash provides so much flexibility. If something happens with her where I need to be home, I can just log out and just say, okay, my family needs me. I don't have to answer to nobody. I don't want to be nobody's employee. I do what I want. I'm independent. Independent lady. That's what I like about it. That's the big reason why flexibility, people enjoy being able to work as much or as little as they want. And that's exactly what you get with these type of jobs with whether it's Uber or DoorDash, you're able to sign up, log in and then take orders as much as you want. And then if you have anything come up, like she has a special needs daughter, she can stop work immediately and then go back home. And there's no boss saying you have to stay here from eight to five every day. So that is the big selling point of working for DoorDash is the flexibility with it. But there's also reasons where I think people work for DoorDash over the competition like Uber with Uber Eats. DoorDash already has the majority market share. So they already have the most orders coming through. So if you're looking to take a lot of orders and not have a lot of downtime when you are working, you wanna go with whatever platform has the, more, the most orders coming through, which is DoorDash. So they have a little bit of a, a network effect there, a little bit of a lead that I think helps them maintain all these dashers working for them. Now, let's go ahead and jump in to this hedge fund letter. Again, this is Aurora Capital, and this is in January. So just last month, they bought into this position at its current price, right at a $60 billion market cap. So this wasn't like this hedge fund bought in when it was like 30 or $40 billion. Uh, they say in this beginning summary here, they outline right here, their thesis on investing into DoorDash, a basic overview of it. They say DoorDash is the newest position in Aurora's portfolio. The thesis below outlines why we believe that DoorDash remains in the very early stages of growth and therefore offers a very compelling future return for shareholders. This is an investment that suits Aurora because of its, it's predicated on a long-term vision of a company developing significant market power in its industry. In fact, there are few companies with as strong of competitive advantages in their market that operate in as large of a market that DoorDash does. So let's look at a few things they outline here. They believe that DoorDash is in the very early stages of growth. I agree with that. DoorDash is growing rapidly. I think that this market of food delivery is just getting started and DoorDash is, is very early on with it. So agreed there. They also say that DoorDash has a competitive advantage, which means they believe DoorDash has somewhat of a moat. That one I think is questionable. That was what I was most curious about with DoorDash, but I do think that they do have a moat. It's just more difficult to see. And then they also state that DoorDash has a large, uh, a large market, which is like the total addressable market. I agree with that. I think the total addressable market for food delivery is enormous. And like I said, it's just getting started. Now, on the note of competitive advantage, when I was initially looking at DoorDash, 
there was something that confused me. I'll go ahead and show you on the screen here. This is DoorDash compared to the competition and the market share over time. DoorDash is this color right here, like this kind of pastel pink. And then you have Uber Eats right here in the red. Then you have Postmates, which Uber Eats just recently purchased. And then you have Grubhub. Now notice something here. DoorDash started off with roughly the same market size as any of the others. In fact, they started off with much less market share than Grubhub. But over time, they grew this market share like crazy. DoorDash now controls half the food delivery market, beating out all the competitors. And I looked at this graph and I thought, how did they do that? What advantage did they have? How did they beat out Uber Eats and Postmates and Grubhub? Uber Eats already has experience in logistics. They own Uber. So how did they lose this much market share to DoorDash? DoorDash must have figured out something that these other competitors could not figure out. And if you look into it, they actually have. That's what they go over in this investor letter. If we read further down on this letter here, they go over the business model, which has allowed DoorDash to excel above its competitors. It says DoorDash is a food delivery company. The company operates a three-sided marketplace that connects restaurants with consumers while facilitating food delivery between the two by leveraging its network of over 1 million dashers. So they actually grew from the 200,000 that I said before to 1 million over the course of a few months. They've been scaling up their company that quickly. They say, or independent contractors that fulfill DoorDash deliveries. DoorDash has grown rapidly and expects to generate 3 billion of revenue in calendar year 20, so 2020. That's 234% growth on a $25 billion order volume or a 12% take while being profitable. That's incredible. They're already profitable in 2020. DoorDash's market share has increased in the United States from 17% to 50% since January of 2018. That is the image I just showed. Um, and is now substantially ahead of both Uber, which has 26% market share, and Grubhub, which has actually been losing market share and now has 16%. Aurora's thesis is that both network effects and economies of scale give DoorDash intense competitive advantage in local markets. First, DoorDash's three-sided marketplace creates a dynamic network of customers, restaurants, and dashers. The value of this marketplace to each of the parties increases with the increased presence of the remaining two parties. The consumers get broader merchant selection from more restaurants and faster deliveries from more dashers. Restaurants get increased revenue from more customers and dashers, and the dashers get higher wages from more customers and merchants. So this is the, uh, the virtuous circle, right? Where when one of them improves, it improves the other, which improves the other, and it goes in a circle improving itself. This is the type of thing that every company wants, but only a certain amount of them actually have it. It says the DoorDash network therefore creates significant lock-in for all parties in the network via the presence of the other parties. So like I pointed out on that video of why people choose to work for DoorDash over Uber Eats or Grubhub, if you're going to pick to be a dasher or a food delivery person, do you want to pick Grubhub with half the market share of DoorDash? If the wages are, are similar, but DoorDash has double the orders or triple the orders coming through, you're going to pick DoorDash over Grubhub which further increases the other thing. So this is the virtuous circle that they're talking about here. Now this next paragraph, this one right here, I believe is very important. I think this is the reason that DoorDash has excelled above the competition and taken a lot of market share. They say DoorDash's early focus on the three-sided marketplace differentiated itself from competitors. Uber operated a legacy two-sided marketplace with riders and drivers, and therefore introduced restaurants into their ecosystem the one that already existed, as a third party only while maintaining the efficiency of their incumbent business model and therefore sacrificing selection. So Uber is actually at a disadvantage by having their pre-existing business of Uber, the, just the driver network. That didn't work to an advantage, that worked to a, a disadvantage because they already had a pre-existing model that didn't work as well for food delivery. So they kind of did more of a, a duct tape uh, you know, adaptation to their existing business model. With DoorDash, they thought about the business model first working with restaurants. That was where their first thought was, was how can we best do this three-sided marketplace and work with restaurants? Um, so an interesting distinction there. It says that Grubhub viewed an in-house delivery network as a commodity and therefore never invested the time or resources to build one. Big mistake by Grubhub. You can obviously see that they're, they're losing marketplace. DoorDash therefore uh, developed a business model flywheel. That's where you look at the virtuous circle. 
Um, and they said they developed the flywheel before both Uber and Grubhub. And to this day, DoorDash is able to, to deliver a superior product experience as a result. So this is the biggest reason I think that that DoorDash has actually gone ahead of, of Uber Eats or Grubhub. Now they move on and they talk about another thing that I mention all the time with the investments I look at, which is not only first movers advantage, but who really has the scale to take advantage of it. Netflix, again, is a company that had first movers advantage, but they also manage things successfully and they have massive scale, which now helps them. And they're outlining the same thing for DoorDash. You can see a lot of the similarities. They say, secondly, economies of scale now help DoorDash maintain its lead over competitors. Scale economies exist in the food delivery market when an individual company is able to achieve sufficient density of demand in a market to lower the transactional costs below the prevailing market rate. So the bigger scale you have, the lower the transaction cost can be. Consider the example of a DoorDasher that delivers two meals per hour and demands a $15 an hour minimum wage. At an average order value of $30 a meal, the Dasher will need to take 25% of the order value just to meet her minimum earning requirements. $15 of wages divided by 60 of the total meal value delivered. However, if the same Dasher is able to deliver five meals per hour, she only needs to take 10% of the order value to cover minimum expected earnings. Now, I don't think that DoorDash does this where the more orders they get, the less they pay Dashers. I don't think that they do that, but there's certainly a scaling effect. This scale advantage makes it so that DoorDash has much better economics than Uber. And this highlights how DoorDash is beating Uber Eats like crazy economically. The challenge of competing against DoorDash shows up on the reported financial metrics. For the quarter ending September 2020, DoorDash reported $86 million of EBITDA with a 12% take rate. So the take rate is out of the whole order from the customer. How much does DoorDash actually keep for themselves? DoorDash has kept 12%, okay? Pretty low amount. Uber delivery, conversely, reported EBITDA loss of 183 million and a 13% take rate. So DoorDash took less percentage of the money from the orders and they had a profit of 86 million. Uber delivery, they took a higher percentage, 13%. So they took 1% more of each order and they lost 183 million instead of being net positive. They say, therefore, DoorDash is able to generate more profit than Uber delivery, 86 million gain versus a $183 million loss, despite lower prices, 12% take instead of 13. In other words, DoorDash's scale advantage allows the company to price their product low enough that the market opportunity is unprofitable for the competitors, but it's profitable for itself. So Uber is unable to be both profitable or competitive. Uber has to choose between profits or being competitive with DoorDash. DoorDash doesn't have to choose. They can be more competitive than Uber while maintaining profitability. DoorDash has introduced product innovations that take advantage of their scale economies. For example, Dash Pass is a subscription program. You guys know how much I love subscription programs. It's like the, uh, the business model, the economic model of the future is subscriptions. And that allows members to pay $10 a month for an unlimited free deliveries. So you pay 10 bucks and then throughout the month as you order meals, you save more and more money. So it also incentivizes people to use DoorDash more because it's cheaper to use. Um, the effect of the Dash Pass service is to reduce the zero of the marginal cost of delivery for the Dash Pass member, incentivizing them to go all in on DoorDash as their single delivery service. That is a huge aspect of it there. So Dash Pass also works to save them money but it works mostly to keep them on DoorDash over com um, competitors like Grubhub and Uber Eats. So they're signing up millions of people for Dash Pass now. Uh, they say the popularity of Dash Pass, 30% of total DoorDash customers are members, indicates customers are taking this incentive and the scale of Dash Pass relative to Uber's subscription service, 5 million to 1 million respectively, indicates this incentive will be costly for Uber. So DoorDash does have a moat over Uber Eats, which is their subscription service that if you're paying for that, you're going to be locked into DoorDash. That's one aspect of the moat they have on top of the scale advantage that they have. And then they kind of give their summary thesis here. They say DoorDash thesis is therefore the network effects, the economies of scale that allow DoorDash to provide customers a consistently higher quality product at a consistently cheaper cost than any competitor can. Continued market share gains in a $300 billion food industry or food service industry are inevitable. So they think that this company is going to grow and that that's inevitable. 
Now the next part that they talk about is the valuation and they go into detail, breaking down the revenue per order, the cost of goods per order, the sales and marketing costs, and how they think everything will play out. I don't wanna go into detail on all of that in this video. I'll leave a link to this letter in the description if you wanna look at it, but I'll give you the summary. They say, with a revenue base of $15 billion and the calendar year 26, so 2026, uh, and nearly $5 billion of EBITDA at a 25 times multiple, it implies a $125 billion enterprise value up from 60 billion today. So 60 billion going to 120 billion by 2026 would imply around a 15% annualized return. And that's their valuation on it. Now with that valuation, there's one risk that I wanna highlight because I know it's gonna be brought up in the comments. I know that you guys are gonna talk about this risk. They say ongoing risks to the investment and one of them is driverless technology. What if Tesla comes out with their completely driverless vehicle that can just go and pick up food and deliver it without any humans involved? That would be a potential problem for DoorDash, right? That's how the thought process goes. I don't think it would be. And this explains why. They say driver earnings are the single greatest cost to customers. So when you order your food from a restaurant and you have it delivered, the transaction between getting your food from the restaurant to your doorstep, the biggest expense is the drivers paying their wages. Therefore, a company that is able to deliver uh, with driverless technology may be able to build their own food delivery marketplace and win the prize. He also highlights why he thinks that that's very unlikely. I agree with this. I believe that this is unlikely because any driverless technology company will see it more beneficial to be the industry's Boeing than the industry Southwest. Outsourcing the finished product of a high-tech process to a low-tech industry is likely to prove more profitable than, than vertical integration. So they're saying that if there is driverless technology, there's more incentive to just license the technology to the marketplace leader instead of trying to compete with them. Trying to compete with DoorDash when they already have all this brand recognition and this huge name and all this network effect would be very costly, even if you had complete advantage of driverless vehicles. It would just be easier to license the, your product with them. They say this is particularly true of technology markets where data is currency. The real cost to Waymo, for example, is not the margin that is lost by outsourcing their technology to DoorDash. Rather, it is the opportunity cost of not having their software embedded on vehicles that are fulfilling billions of customer orders per day, so or per year. So they outline advantages already of tech companies doing this. So this is one of the big risks that they outline. There's also other ones, government regulation, post-pandemic financials, and it basically shares the same thoughts I do. I don't think that these things are going to happen where people stop using food delivery now because the lockdowns are over. I think people are going to continue doing it. Now, in the final summary, they say DoorDash is the perfect Aurora investment, a category leader with an underappreciated moat. This is something that I look for as well, is a company that has a moat, but most people don't really know that it has a moat or they don't understand it because a moat is not so obvious. There's companies with obvious moats. Apple's one of them. Apple has a billion phones out there and devices. It's very difficult to start a phone company. So Apple already owns half this market. So they have a huge moat. It's very visible. Most people already know about the moat. So it's priced into the company. But there's companies where I've seen where they, I believe they have significant moats, but people don't understand how significant their moat is. Netflix is one that I give as an example. It already has a huge economy of scale. It has so many subscribers that it can produce so much content, which lowers its churn rate and so on and so forth. They're saying that DoorDash has an underappreciated moat, which means it has not been priced into the company appropriately. And they also operate in markets of underappreciated scale. So they believe the scale is bigger than most people believe. He says, I believe that both network effects and economies of scale give DoorDash intense competitive advantage in local markets. Network effects ensure superior product quality while economies of scale ensure that DoorDash can deliver the superior product to customers at the cheapest cost. DoorDash's market size is estimated at 300 billion and I see few impediments to the company capturing a, size, uh, a sizable piece of that spend. So massive market spend out there. He believes that DoorDash will, will take advantage of that and be probably one of the biggest players and again, with my portfolio, with the Story Fund, we're looking for companies that are in growing markets with big addressable markets, and it's winner take most. Uber Eats will probably be a big company. This isn't a thesis that I believe DoorDash will win and Uber Eats will fail. It's saying that I believe DoorDash has the highest likelihood 
to take a large portion of this already big market. They have the lead, they have the scale advantage, they've already executed very well. You can look at the execution so far, going from a very small uh, market share to 50% now, shows that the management already knows what they're doing. They just need to keep using their scale advantage, keep executing, keep marketing well, growing their Dash Pass and getting more subscribers signed up to it. And I think that DoorDash has a huge opportunity here. You look at it and you say it's $60 billion, you can compare that to FedEx, but let's be honest, FedEx and these type of companies are nothing like DoorDash. DoorDash gives you the opportunity to be like a CEO, having an executive assistant that you can press a couple buttons and they drop you off food. That is power to the consumer, power that FedEx does not give them. So this company has something special. There's other competitors that are really trying to eat away and Uber Eats is investing a lot in the competition. But out of the given selection, I think that DoorDash has the highest likelihood to take a large market share and to continue to take an enormous market share of this enormous growing market. So I hope you enjoyed this research and look into DoorDash. It's one of the companies I'm excited about amongst many in my portfolio. If you want to see all the companies I'm invested in and get instant notification of all the buys and sells I do, you can check out the Patreon. There's a link in the description. If you join that, you get access to the Discord community and you can message me anytime. I'm on it every single day. So you're not bothering me if you send me direct messages on the Discord. But uh, otherwise, I appreciate you guys for viewing. Thanks for subscribing. I'll see you next time.